All right, all right, all right. How's it going, you guys? Great to see all you beautiful people here tonight. We are here for the second annual IF3 Mountain Bike Film Festival. I am Darren Barracloth. And I am Michaela Gatto, and we are going to be your wonderful hosts this evening. Um, first of all, big shout out to our sponsors for making this festival happen. And uh, we've got Steam Whistle Brewing sponsoring us here, wetting our palates all evening. And a uh, special shout out to the Sentier du Moulin yeah. back east in Quebec. Apparently there's over 100 people in a bar watching this right now online. So what up? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So tonight we're going to be interviewing a few of the uh, film's uh, athletes and their producers. And then after that, we're going to be uh, left with watching a few films. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. First up, we've got Sam Scoffey and Haley Elise. Wow, that just got bright. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, so we're going to be having a little chat with them, watch a little bit of a BTS, and then move straight into interviewing Colin and Ian from mm -hmm. Ant Hill and Sterl. Yep, if from he's Lightfall. still here, if he hasn't yep. run away Sterling's yet. Sterling's here. See him in the back. Okay, all right, he's here. And uh, we're going to be talking about Long Live Chainsaw and Lightfall with them. Indeed, indeed. And then after that, we're going to be interviewing ourselves. <laughs> Both Michaela and I have some films that were premiering as we were the athletes. And uh, since we're the hosts, we're going to be sitting down and uh, switching the roles and interviewing each other. Having a chat, just in case you guys aren't sick of our voices yet by the end of the night, we're going to also, yeah, chat to each other. So hang tight, and uh, here are some of the films that are going to be screening after we are done talking. So seven, seven till nine. Yes, that yes. is correct. Yes. Yep, so, so there they are. They're different for you guys here than they are on the people watching online, but two of the same ones are the falling riding off cliffs, not yep. falling off cliffs. Reed Boggs' film? Yeah, <laughs> you don't want to fall off cliffs. No. And Lightfall, so that's yeah. the same for both. Pretty excited about those. Yeah. And then the, uh, the matinees that we're gonna be uh, watching, and those are gonna be tomorrow yep. here at the Rio Theater. Uh, there's going to be two, one screening at uh, 2 p.m. and then two screenings at 3.30 p.m. Yes, yes, so those are the matinees tomorrow. And then tomorrow night is the moment we've all been waiting for. Yeah. The gala and the awards. So it's the first ever IF3 movie awards. And they've got a ton of different awards for all the different talent from producer to writers to film. Um, so you don't want to miss that one. And then there's also obviously going to be some screenings then. Absolutely. Yeah. So shall we get this uh, show on the road? Yes, we shall. Michaela. So we've got... Sam and Haley, if you guys could come up for your Dancing in the Mountains. Yeah. I won't sit down yet. Is that rude for me to sit down? Come on up. Have a seat. Come on, have a beer. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Perfect. Nice to meet you. Cheers. Hi, Hi, pal. Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. I love this because we yeah. just get to sit and interview our friends. It's like the best job ever. Yeah. yeah. Crack one. So. Thank the, uh, the awesome sponsors for uh, helping put on this the venue. It kind of brings me back to the old bike magazine award days. I don't know. Is that past your time or am I? Am I Before my time? Am I dating You're myself? Old. You're pretty old. But yeah. <laughs> um, just, hold them, just make sure you hold the mics close to your faces so we can hear all the amazing things you have to say. Will do. <laughs> In and around. Okay. All right. So, Haley, I watched... Well, both of you. I watched your film this morning, and I was blown away by just the process that you have gone through to get to where you are. And I just wanted to ask mental versus physical hurdles, what has been the most helpful thing for you for getting through those hurdles in your career? Oh. Probably resources, like knowing that there's coaches and there's sports psychologists and there's friends and all of the above to get you through the hard times and help you move forward. Yeah. 
And I, yeah, I mean, it's obvious once you guys see the movie, the camaraderie and the crew that you have and the support that you have through your friends. That's like, it's it's so like magical and awesome to watch. So that's cool for you to say that that's like a been a big help for sure. I have a confession. What? I actually haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I came here today to see it for the first time. So I'm it's really amazing. Awesome. Yeah, you I'm did an amazing excited. job. Yeah, yeah, great work. Thank you so much. That's so fun. It. Yeah. So it's a uh, surprise, and uh, yeah. Not even parts of it. Little tiny pieces of it, but not very much. So yeah, I I wanted to just like see it all at once. So save yeah. it for the big screen. <laughs> yeah, save it for the big screen. Well, maybe Sam, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, I think you've mentioned it well in terms of the separating the mental and the physical aspect of it. And I think that was the most interesting thing about, I don't think you know that, but that when we built the film, we only did it with your voice in the beginning, no image. And it was actually really good. So, uh, I mean, if anybody wants to close their eyes tonight, you can. But, uh, no, uh, to be honest, um, she, she really paved the way <laughs> beautifully uh, in the way she articulates all of the challenges that she's going through to get there. And uh, all of her friends, amazing friends, and the, the line they built and everything they've done, it's, it was, I mean, super um, inspiring to follow them for, was it a week? Six yeah. days, something like that. <laughs> and it, my first time also in the Whistler, so it was pretty special to uh, live all of that in one week and follow this dynamic <laughs> group of people. Well, man, you pretty much have the ultimate crew for your first time in Whistler, not gonna lie. That's pretty sick. <laughs> nice. So Haley, tell me a bit about the emotional roller coaster that you went through from being a content producer athlete from the passion side of things to all of a sudden being an expectation you kind of alluded a little bit in your in your piece there but i just want to know a little bit more about that side um for me i think it's been something for most of my life where i didn't really believe that you could do these kind of things and so when it first started it was just having a good time. And it was actually Ollie and I, I remember sitting at a dead end road and the two of us looked at each other and we were like, hey, like, do you want to work hard on this and try to make something out of it? And it was the first time somebody actually said, like, you can, if you work really hard, something more can happen from this. And I, I know there's a lot of other factors and so forth involved in that, but that was something I just didn't know that could happen. I thought it was the, the you know, special people or extremely talented people that could, could move through these successes and so um, emotional roller coaster yeah like then when you realize that it's possible and you realize that you want it really bad it becomes uh, torturous at times like absolute elation at other times but yeah it's a it's a journey but I think that's also why I love it and a lot of my people love it and so forth is that you know the good good highs and sometimes there's some low low lows but you always come out or you try to at least. <laughs> well, I know you haven't seen it yet, but that is like a perfect recap of what we will see in the dancing in the mountains. Like you, I'm so excited. yeah, it's like, it's like she like made it or something. It's like you're like the star of the show. Um, last thing before we watch a little bit of B-roll um, of the film, um, what tip do you have to other aspiring female athletes? Like you just said, you didn't think it was possible. What, what tip do you have? to get girls out there? Um, surround yourself by good people that inspire you and you know, you're gonna get knocked down, but the getting back up is what counts. So get back up. Amazing. Another question I got for you is, um, any backlash to drop in the name of the zone in the film? Not as of yet, <laughs> but okay. that definitely could be a possibility. Um, right. Yeah, that is, it is a rec area and there's a like, you know, yeah, a lot of recreation, various mo moto and there's, you know, we've built some other features around in there and stuff. And so um, there's not much there, but it definitely has potential. So I think there's right. the opportunity for, I mean, if you, if you want to go out and you want to find that stuff and you want to build it, then give her. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking inspiration rather yeah. than backlash. It's like, whoa, we can go to the Sioux Valley and do this? Let's 
Yeah, let's get after it. Giver, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good sick. to uh, it's good to share. You know, it's it's the day and age of where people just want to keep that amongst their you know, the riding scene and the riding friends, especially with the fresh loamy trail, you know, we're all in search of the fresh loam. So it's uh it's nice to see that um, you know, it's not secret. It's kind of nice. Yeah, and I mean, it is a pretty special place, but if there's more people putting shovels in the dirt and there ends up being more out there than more trails for people to ride. So. More trails to shred. <laughs> Indeed. That is the backbone of mountain biking. You know, not a lot of people remember back in the days when, you know, guys like Digger and all the original North Shore crew guys, they just did it for the passion, for the love of biking. And, and a lot of people nowadays that have gotten into the sport recently, they're just, they forget about there was janky hand-built trails. They're just so, you know, used to just seeing these buff bike park built wonderlands in the forest you know totally and that's actually what was kind of cool about the trail that the guys built is they did, did build it by hand and we had they had done a few test runs down it but it wasn't really until we actually started trying to like work through it all as a whole and get from top to bottom that it was like hey there's some pieces of this that don't necessarily work so and you'll see i think that was definitely a moment where i was like how do i i, I don't know how to get over this and it was like whoa whoa let's let's like rebuild it <laughs> so put yeah, when it's your own trail, you can do that. Yeah, it's like, yeah. this isn't working? All right, let's change where it goes. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's kind of what happens when you're, you're hand-building something is that it doesn't always work at first. And again, you're, 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 there's that potential failure like right in front of you. But yeah, you just pivot and move from there. So that's what we did. And so on that, scouting the location for the trail, what is the process in like deciding where you think a trail is going to start and finish, where it's going to go? Do you just go by good vibes or do you have a plan or do you just kind of go as you go along? I wish I could take some credit for where this trail was. <laughs> we have, the Sioux is like very special to our friend group, but it was 100% Megs and Ollie and the homies. Like the, all the boys put down some, put some effort into that, but they had walked around that forest and, you know, absolutely loved it, saw the potential, and yeah, they just started in one place, and then they would get to a certain section, and they're like, all right, let's scout the rest of it, and so they found some, there was like some crazy cliffs and stuff, and they're like, all right, not over there, so yeah, steered it around, you know, and then you end up with like massive logs, massive rocks, and, but yeah, it, it was all them. I, I came I, and moral support. There's a mosquito, really crazy mosquitoes out there, Oh, guys. yeah. I remember that. I remember that. We went yeah. and walked it. Yeah. And it was like they had these crazy machines that they bought online. Yeah, to like, thermocells. Yeah. 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 Get the mosquitoes away that were like hardcore. You'd have to, we were wearing like full nets and then had these thermocells. They're Jurassic Park size mosquitoes in that neck of the woods. Aggressive. Yes. Just waiting for you. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Back to you. You were along for this ride. The whole start to finish? No, no, no. They they built they worked on it for two years before I arrived. So oh, so you just got to reap the benefits. Of <laughs> exactly. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. All the but benefits. But you said you started creating the film just by using Haley's voiceover. Is that how you usually go about creating something, or is it just sort of like how this happened because she was so art articulate in her story? 100% Haley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, just, uh, I think, like, from the first call we had, I was like, you know, I should have recorded this. And every call it was kind of like this. And uh, I'm happy we were able to kind of have conversation with felt natural, so natural that uh, we, we hear the dogs behind and everything, but it's all good. And, uh, but yeah, so we just got into a really authentic conversation. And she's just, honestly, all credit to her. She's just really her level of, of uh, conscience about uh, you know, what she's going through is, and the way she's able to describe it is like a, a gift to a filmmaker and especially all of the you know, adjectives she uses and how she constructs things, it's just like paved the way again, so yeah. <laughs> I would concur, she's one of my good friends and she's given me a lot of advice and, and definitely knows what's up when it comes to explaining the challenges of the sports psyche so that's pretty cool indeed i loved every minute of it great work guys well thanks thank so, much. so much thank you so yeah. much awesome great having you guys i think we got another okay so we got another interview coming up we sure do yeah all right guys there it is 
We've got Ian yeah. Dunn and Colin Jones and Sterl. Yeah. Please all, come up. All good fellow friends of mine. Oh, we got a third chair for you, Sterl. Yeah. Sterl's looking comfy. He's drinking yeah. his beer. Oh, yeah. We want to hear from you. Yeah, bud. Good seeing you. These guys are no strangers in the mountain bike industry. Ann Hill Films and Sterling Warrants. You've had to uh, be sitting under a rock if you don't know uh, or any, haven't seen any of their uh, their work in the last uh, decade or two. I know Sterl has been uh, a big a big portion of my success in my career. And uh, cheers, bud. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been great to see you guys keep the torch going strong. And uh, yeah, this is amazing. I love the love the piece. So. Should we start talking about, yeah, let's talk about the, uh, the Stevie Smith tribute. Let's yeah, don't hand that. that mic over just yet. You're coming, you're important, yeah. okay. but we're talking to Colin first. Check one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had a couple questions for you guys, Ian and Colin. Um, obviously, Long Live Chainsaw, the Stevie Smith documentary, massive undertaking, um, a lot of pressure, I'm sure. How did you guys deal with the pressure to create such an important piece of art and media for the mountain bike industry. Um, wow, thanks, Michaela. <laughs> That's really, um, <laughs> first of all, it took a massive group of people to be able to pull it off. And Colin and I were just part of one small part of a really big team. Uh, within Antill, Darcy Winberg and Darren McCullough, who couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately. They really led the project um, with Darcy being director and Darren editing. And yeah, I mean, I guess with anything, you just kind of start, you know, and do your best. And we were really lucky to have a lot of people who really cared deeply about Stevie's legacy and um, had personal connection to him. And so people all over the world uh, from filmmakers, we made the film during COVID. So it wasn't also easy. a challenge. Yeah. So people do donated their time to do interviews um, in, in the UK in, um, and in Europe. And uh, yeah, they donated their footage, they donated their photos, um, and they just donated their time to try and make the best film possible. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen Long Live Chainsaw, but it is like such an immersive documentary from the start of Stevie Smith's life to the end and um, there's just so much packed into it. And I guess you just touched on the accumulation of all of the media that it took to create something like this. Um, and you said you just kind of had to start. So where did you start? Did you, where did you start? Where do you even start? Where'd you, uh, do you want to take a one seat here? Well, yeah, it's, it, it came down to like, uh, I think it was to reach out and talk to Stevie's biggest fan, who's his mother. So going and traveling to the island and sitting down with her and getting her blessing, but also getting her like thoughts on the project and starting there was a really big starting point, I would say. And then um, after that, it was, I think he was just so beloved inside the industry of mountain biking that getting support with, Getting support from everyone was a big in the next step, but uh, it wasn't hard, right? Like people love Stevie, and yeah, I would say that that was kind of the two main starting points. I feel like we were all sort of like waiting for it to happen, and we're pretty happy when we heard that you guys, of of anyone in the industry, were taking it on to create that documentary because you guys are so well respected in movie making. So yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I loved every every minute of it, as it was a tearjerker, as you can. Uh, everyone can all imagine. Um, one of the things that myself and maybe some of the uh, audience might need to, to know is uh, how many years did you guys work with Steve uh, before he passed? Um, yeah, that would have been uh, seasons. So it would probably have been like, I think it was Gabe was the, Gabe who's... Um, Wasn't it the collective? It was a collect. Yeah, no, it was it the, the, the shuttle and the tracker. Moms up and down Seasons. 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 Oh, But the wow. third collective film. Yeah, it wasn't. Just the got first. schooled right here. <laughs> You're in it. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that was like 2007, and he was 16, 
I mean, you guys grew up racing with him and all that, so they, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he was just a young kid on the island, very loose, and like in that film, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty crazy to be that part, shooting that segment of like just, his only part of that film was mostly just to represent the up and comer or like, the kid he wanted to make it happen and it was crazy that it turned out that he became the best in the world yeah little did we all know that he was gonna turn into the best canadian ever to you know debatable to ever race the dh circuit pretty iconic um mm. i just wanted to go on that he's been behind been in front of your lenses for decades in making the documentary, was there anything new that you learned about Stevie that really surprised you or you want to share? I, when we went into making it, we kind of knew already the, his story. And I think a lot of people, when they watch the film, will be surprised because a lot of people found out about Stevie as he made his way up to the World Cup circuit. And obviously, when he, made, um, when he became the overall champion, uh, that kind of they kinda... took over the mountain bike industry and he became this fan and some people knew him too from seasons and stuff but I don't like I think his inner circle knew where he came from and mm -hmm. how hard it was mm -hmm. how what an unlikely story it was for him to make it to where he did from where he's where he had to start from um, so I think that was and that's gonna be I think a surprise for a lot of people for us, the thing that probably surprised us personally the most was just the overwhelming outpouring of just support, like I mentioned earlier. And you kind of had a sense of it, but it was definitely the most, I would say, hey, Colin, like such an emotionally, it was like sad, but also just so Beautiful. privileged to be yeah. able to, to work on a project like this. So yeah. I think coming from like an action sports background, that kind of took us by surprise. Yeah, it makes you realize how, just how passionate we are as mountain bikers for the sport that we do, but also the people and the bonds that we make in the sport. It's next to none. It's really amazing. We're like a big, one big family, family, one big happy family. Um, so I guess the last thing would be, the film has been, well, for me, I might have some other questions. Um, actually, I have two questions. Is there anything that didn't make it into the film that you wish did? Tons. Yeah, I was going to say that's <laughs> the <stupid>. hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were so many interviews that we wanted to do that, you know, and so many stories that we wanted to pursue. And so many people had so many amazing stories, Stevie stories. Is there like one standout story that just like makes you laugh that you think like, I know, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot right now. It, well, it can be inappropriate. I think uh, it's, that's a tough one. The one that jumped into my mind, though, was uh, Semenuk said that his vision was really bad and he needed glasses. Stevie's? Stevie, yeah. Uh, and he said that he actually embraced that because he didn't, because he was such an insane racer and he was going over such challenging terrain, but he attributes it to his lack of vision, of lack of seeing what he was looking, what he was riding. So can't be scared if you can't see it. <laughs> I heard he was really colorblind too. So he's just, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's amazing. That's that really a... interesting. <laughs> um, and then the last thing was like for me is the film's been out for a few months now. I went to the Nanaimo premiere. Um, what has the impact been? Have you heard the feedback from the viewers? The impact it's had. Positive. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's been incredible. Um, probably every single day we get a message, you know, on social media or an email from people who've seen the film, um, people like kids who didn't know about Stevie, whose parents were fans that watched the film with their kids, and then their kids have done like done drawings and as art projects, and just messages from people saying like, "Oh, it's such an inspiration for me to know that I can do this." and um, I guess from some of the people we worked on the film too, right, from a lot of the young Canadian racers, for them to hear from them about how much Stevie meant to them and to have a Canadian to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, you kind of need that first person to be like, oh yeah, it's possible. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, it, I, it was huge. It was huge. And that's when you know you make a really good film is when you've got 
people's kids doing drawings and sending yeah. them to you months after it's come out. So that's like definitely like the coolest thing you got where you get these. Right? Or like kids history. dressing up as the, them for Halloween and it's yeah, it's it's so cool. And that's that's exactly what Stevie would have wanted, I think. I would agree with you there. there. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you pretty much nailed the nailed the head or right on the head with all my questions. <laughs> Hit the nail on the head with all my questions as well. Sorry, um, I kind of run that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but switching gears to uh, Sterling's little uh, little piece there, it's uh, it's pretty refreshing to see uh, your process and how you go about doing what you do, getting the A grades in the bank and being that guy for so many years. And I thought it was beautiful that you guys decided to, to shoot a film, short film, about it. And yeah, I was just super thrilled to, uh, to see that. Kayla, what you got for him? Yeah, um, it was the creation of the creator creating. It was wild. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet. Lightfall? No? Um, essentially just following you and you're creating this impossible shot on the shore, in the fog, with lights up in trees, your main model got injured. <laughs> Do you ever at any point when you're like knee deep in mud on the shore, Brett gets hurt, are you like, maybe not? Maybe not. Um, well, yeah, thank you for, for all this. Um, <laughs> back to the claw. Um, we've, been, we've been through this stuff together as well, which is cool. It's an honor to have been doing similar projects with him. And, and, and those projects back all the way back to the early days, those are little, little clues and little things that you learn along the way that, that you learn from. And, and uh, um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, to your question, really living on the North Shore, which is, I'm very fortunate to be, to be able to live there and to have my career kind of blossom there. It's my backyard. So um, I, I don't, yes, I could have given up on it, but really it's a, that this photograph or this process is kind of like a challenge that I put on myself and it's part of kind of a series of kind of lighting from above. So. I, there was really no clock on it, and I would have to give a lot of thanks to the Ant Hill guys for being patient, um, and Brett as well, and Jackson, but also um, Shimano as a brand. I got to call out Shimano and, and some of their creatives there as a brand have always been so supportive. Um, they're the ones that kind of let us just go and run with something like this, and they're not putting a clock on it. So um, it could have been tricky if we were marginalized into a two-week period, I think I would have probably said no to it if that was the case. There would have been an asterisk right from day one that said, hey, if we're digging in on this together, this might take a long time. And it could be really easy. As the claw knows, we could show up tomorrow and it could have been there right for us on day one and we got it. And that wouldn't have been a very dramatic story. You're dreaming. <laughs> yeah, we're dreaming, as you know. But it happens. Um, some people get lucky. And, uh, and for the drama in this, maybe it was cool that it took us a longer time. You know, there was a few close calls there where it was raining and the rain never really stopped and the fog kind of teased us and we all got cold and it wasn't quite there. But there was moments there where it, it was almost there and then all of a sudden six weeks goes by and it, there's no clouds and everything and all of a sudden the season went by. So we knew from the beginning that it might take five weeks and it might take a year, might take two years. And, and if we didn't do it yet, we would still be working on it because we would have just shelved it and we would have figured out a way of like getting the content when the moment happened. I wasn't, I still have a curiosity of doing that kind of photography and that kind of lighting. So if I didn't get it that day, I would have applied that somewhere else probably. Yeah, absolutely. Timing is key on those, those ones. Um, one question I got for you. Even though that I know you got it on the first or maybe the second shot, how many times did you get Jackson to hit it? Um, well, <laughs> you know me, you know me well enough that, that I, <laughs> Actually, to be honest with you, the Jackson Day was was kind of like a reward, I would say, for us. I, 
I, you know, mother nature, karma, all that stuff, you're going to, if you put in your time, mother, mother nature and karma is going to reward you at some point. And poor Brett had to do. All yeah. That. Unfortunately, <laughs> Brett, it. Brett gave us the luck of Jackson's day. And that's, it's, it's funny how life just is like that sometimes where he kind of, let's say, gets the raw deal to the point where Jackson's going to roll up and it's all just going to unfold. And that day went as smooth and easy as it gets um, for predicting what might be a fog day, putting Jackson on standby a couple days before, warning him the night before, getting up super early, having the weather do what it needed to do for us that day, um, and, then, and then actually telling him to make his way down from Squamish, and then all of a sudden the pressure builds of like, okay, let's hope that this isn't a dud, which it could be. Um, and he rolled up and literally as we walked up into the forest, I mean, um, with all that hard work that had happened with Brett, it, for me to do the photo was actually very easy because I knew exactly the two places I wanted to go. I've literally pra I practiced by myself at times when the riders couldn't be there and it was foggy. I'm taking my gear there and actually shooting like um, test shots and being like, okay, I know exactly what I want here. Um, so. I, I got to be in that fortunate position where I spent too much time getting ready in the day that, that Jackson rolled in. I think we might have actually had one of the shots on the first try. Um, oh, I know you it, did. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't, he knows that I might have tried to get him to do it 45 times, but um, it okay. wasn't, we had that, we had the shots. I would say that Jackson, and again, back to the, the respecting what the athlete needs to contribute to the shot. The athlete, I want the athlete to be seeing the imagery, hence we've got the iPad going, welcoming the rider to, to, to check out their their at their style. And in pure respect for that, that Jackson, Jackson himself was saying, I, you could just, you could, you could hear him in the air, even like gasping at like, didn't quite click it the way he wanted to. So I can hear that. I can see it. And he's landing and coming up and saying, I didn't quite get it. And he's not and even you're coming. You're like, yeah, I know. He, he's not even coming up to the monitor yet. So it's actually him driving the attempts. If he had said, I don't like it and I, I've done it enough. Um, and we got it in three tries. So be it. But in respect for Jackson, he was wanting to click it in a certain manner. And um, I would say I might have taken 10 photos that day with him. Nice. And we, we, we kept three. There's may, um, it might have even been maybe seven, seven tries, and we were done. And, Amazing. And then back to the luck of the fog. Um, it was as thick and dry and dense as I've ever seen it. And I remember not, I wasn't going to say anything because as you know, it's like jinxing it. It's like, wow, it's so perfect. And all of a sudden it's gone. But I was kind of whispering to myself and, and calling like, this is ridiculous what we're getting here. And we probably got two and a half hours of just bliss kind Magic. of. So yeah, I love it. Um, I think yeah. it was really cool too, like what you guys captured was that creative process. And then not only the inner workings of your process as a creative, which I think the mountain bike industry doesn't get to see a lot of, there isn't, it's always focused on the athlete. So that's what I really liked, like as an artist myself, to see the process and, and to really shine light on the fact that there is this human being behind the lens who's very special, <laughs> who dedicates their life to getting the shots that we get to see on Instagram, on the cover of magazines, and the hours, I have like goosebumps, and like the hours and years of work that goes into one shot. Um, so I think that was really cool. But then also the relationship between the photographer and the athlete, like you were mentioning, listening to Jackson in the air, kind of like make a noise and you could tell he wasn't happy, even though you were happy. And it's like this dance of like the athlete being happy with how they look in the photo, but then the photographer also needing to be happy with the composition and everything else. We're also else. very critical. Yes, and as athletes being extremely critical of ourselves, maybe you nailed it, maybe the fog was perfect in the light and everything, but then Jackson's like, oh, my finger was in the wrong spot or whatever. Like, my toes were pointed different, you know? I mean, it's, it's so true. I, I think um, the, well, I, I really, I reference 
like it as it were like a team and it's always been like that and as you're a team if you're sort of moving together the team does well as a whole versus just sort of the individual pursuits of just showing up and and on those days if it's a team effort the result is always so much stronger and i've always just tried to to be that that part of it i feel so honored and lucky in my career to actually have a role alongside you know world-class athletes as yourself or filmmakers and that I can actually play this role right here in a team environment and I've sort of always felt that way and, and you can sense when that's working and when it's not and when somebody's not being a teammate, let's say. It's definitely a pursuit. I mean, as you're just talking on Haley's film, it's a, there's a team environment there and everybody has to kind of be pushing in the right direction and when that happens, special stuff happens for sure. Yeah, yeah amazing. Well, folks, there you have it. The inside line on what it takes to make the magic and the imagery I highly Sterling recommend. Lawrence I highly and the crew you guys watch it yeah um yeah. well thank you guys so much for coming up here and being in front of the lens and uh we're gonna go to a little commercial break and then we're gonna have a little bit of a chat indeed <laughs> and each you. other so thanks so much thanks, thanks for guys. watching Welcome back, folks. We're here with Michaela Gatto in the hot seat, and we're going to be talking about Back 40. It's a uh, project that um, she is an athlete in. So can you tell me a little bit about what you girls have been up to uh, doing some filming on uh, a place that I call home? Yeah, so the Back 40 is a project that Casey Brown actually was in charge of. Uh, I got invited by her, and her, Georgia Astle, and I did a first season of The Back 40. We did a few episodes and then made like a full on film, 20 minute long thing, driving to the Yukon and back. She came back to me the next year, 
and wanted to do one on Vancouver Island. So I obviously couldn't say no. Um, this time it was only, I think it's only about 11 minutes long. And the vibe was definitely more island vibe, surfy vibes, three girls on a road trip, having a time, doing some cliff jumping, riding some gnar, and uh, just getting to know Vancouver Island. Yeah, and didn't you guys visit in like the heat of the heat dome last summer? It actually wasn't so bad. Yeah, it was hot, but like it wasn't crazy. Was it, it was like 40 degrees? No, yeah. no, 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 no. So I it was think... just past the heat dome. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was totally manageable, but we definitely had a lot of swim breaks and found some sweet little spots. But uh, yeah, we essentially traveled the whole kind of from Duncan up to Campbell River on the east coast of the island and then popped over to Tofino for a brief moment of surf. Indeed, yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, being a Vancouver Islander my whole life, obviously it uh, holds a sweet place in my heart, but um, it seems like a lot of people are really taking notice of the, the old rock these days, and obviously you girls coming across and uh, shredding all the local spots. What was your favorite spot that you hit up for riding-wise? Oh my gosh. <sighs> Favorite trail, let's just call it that. Yeah, Vancouver Island's so cool because every spot is different. Like you'd think like, oh, it's all within a couple hours. It's all gonna be sort of the same terrain, sort of the same dirt. Absolutely not. Um, one of the most memorable moments was we went to Mount Washington um, and we linked up with a bunch of local women, but it actually ended up torrential downpouring. Um, so bad that it actually became fun. You know, when it's like raining so hard and you're so muddy and you're so wet that you're just like, all you can do is laugh. I think I saw you there and I did one run. Oh yeah, home. I did. <laughs> yeah. Darren <laughs> showed up and he's like, hey, got it, what's up? And then it just, the skies <laughs> opened up and you're like, peace out, have fun filming. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> um, that was probably, but favorite trail, that's like way too hard. There, I was really proud of that road gap. I hit a road gap. Um, and honestly, I don't even remember what the area was called because we yeah, rode Dumont? so many different areas. In Nanaimo? Nanaimo, yeah. Yeah, Dumont. Yeah, I was pretty stoked on that. It wasn't really a trail, though. It was like a one hit, but that was probably what I was most stoked on because, yeah, it was a little road, road gapper hit. Nice, um, but nice. Yeah. Absolutely. And then out of the West Coast, now this is where you reside as of recently. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I recently moved to the island and I'm not going to lie, that trip really kind of sealed the deal for me. Um, obviously having Steve Smith and Reese Wallace and a bunch of other pros living on the island and, and you, of course, um, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> if you don't mention me. Um, uh, <laughs> he always gives me a hard time. He sees I'm on the island and I don't call she him. He drives right by. I get in trouble. He's like, you drove right by me. Um, but yeah, Obviously, a lot of legends coming out of the island. I had just never experienced the riding for myself. And then after filming that, it was sort of all I needed to give me that small push. And now I'm an islander. And I get to ride those trails all the time. So I'm stoked. Awesome. Good to have you there. So, like, you know, there's, there's trail building, which is, like, in my opinion, the, the soul of mountain biking, where it all began. But on the flip side, we have road trips, you know the act of getting in your vehicle, going to a new town, experiencing a new scene, new people, new pubs, new different beer. Like, what is your favorite part of all of the road trip? Yeah, so... <laughs> it's a big question. I want, I, I, side note, I want to trail build more, um, but I, I like will... That definitely say that I do not do a very good job of it right now. Um, but I do do a good job of traveling to other places <laughs> and reaping the benefits of other people's hard work. Uh, but yeah, the, my favorite part about road tripping, especially with the first season of Back 40 going to the Yukon, um, big trips, is connecting with the locals and seeing kind of like the micro um, cultures within the mountain bike industry and then also experiencing the overarching theme that connects all of us, which is obviously a love of bikes, love of shredding. Um, but yeah. And beer. And beer. Um, shout out to Steam Whistle. Uh, but yeah, no, meeting the people, connecting with locals, getting that local knowledge, getting the local vibe, maybe getting invited to like a house party somewhere with a bunch of the local shredders, um, doing things that you 
wouldn't usually do if you just went there and stayed in a hotel and didn't try to connect with anyone. So for anyone who enjoys overlanding or road tripping and things like that, um, a great place to start, I would say, is local bike shop. Get to know the people there. They're usually pretty open and, and have a lot of good insight. Um, and then even like social media, like sh put it out on your Instagram and be like, hey, I'm in this area. Is anyone around? Like, does anyone want to ride? And you'd be surprised at the amazing people and the amazing connections you meet. I've met some of my best friends um, just by doing that. And it's really rad. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, love it. Road <laughs> trips. It's a good time. That's for damn sure. Should we switch spots? I think so. And that's all the questions I got for her film that she's in. And uh, now we're going to do a little switching and she's going to interview me. A little switcheroo. All right. Yay, Michaela. <laughs> and I do believe you can see the back 40 Vancouver Island. I think that is airing, t screening tomorrow. Nice. During one of the matinees. So check the schedule uh, if you want to see it. All right. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Um, so Darren, I watched your film last night for the first time. Mm -hmm. It is called The Granite Fringe. Essentially, well, first of all, you have kind of transitioned from slope style athlete to now heinous adventures, I think, I should say. Could be a good... Good description. Like, he invited me to do a project, and I said no, because I know. I know. <laughs> we did we did a Bali trip together, which you had nothing, no <laughs> say in, and you still try, made it hard. So, um, Granite Fringe, he's essentially, it looks like you got dropped from the sky. You just picked a point on the earth, and we're like, this looks crazy. Stayed out there for how many days? Uh, that was a five-day trip that we uh, we went out out into. And you know the, the amazing part is, is it's really not that far from where we live. Obviously, yeah, you I'm said it's like near Powell River. Yeah, I'm not going to give the exact location, but um, he's old school like that. Yeah, I like to keep things secret. Um, but yeah, it was a spot that had been on my hit list for many years. There was um, there was a female biker athlete that I recently. Quite a few years ago, saw um, a piece on Pink Bike, and there's some photos and a little bit of editing. But you could tell that, like, they showed up, and it was cloudy. You know, mountains, BC. It's very, very common to to get skunked on the on the good weather. And ever since I saw that, I was like very intrigued because back then. I was as at my peak of traveling the planet searching for the sickest big mountain freeride lines on soft dirt. And then I saw these big mountain lines in the, in the granite and I was like, ooh, that looks amazing, but super scary. Because, you know, dirt's one thing. You fall and you, you know, you can tumble, you break some bones and stuff, but you fall on granite on a sustained slope, it's, it's not going to be a good time. Yeah, I feel like unenjoyable falls go like water... Snow, <laughs> dirt, granite. Yeah, it's it's so. definitely it's a definitely a heavy one. So it was a, it's been on my hit list for years, and and a couple of years ago I was on my boat up Princess Louisa Inlet. I was trying not to say. Oh, the that's names. a location. Yeah, and I saw something in the distance, and I was just Google like, maps. it kind of it kind of relapsed my interest in it. And then I got back to my computer and I started doing some Google Earth thing, which surprisingly <laughs> enough, a lot of people don't know that like you can, a lot of us have found a lot of good zones on Google Earth just because the technology is so good these days. And I started scouring and I'm like, oh man, I, I, need, to, I need to put some eyes on it. So I hired a plane and I did a recon flight uh, and I went across and got pictures and documented everything. And as soon as I saw it with my own eyes, you know, up close and personal, I was like, okay, it is on. And uh, yeah, our goal with this film was to, to basically check out a new zone and kind of discover any big mountain free ride lines. Yeah, just check out a new zone. Yeah, well, Seems that's, mellow. That's um, what we've been doing the last 20 years. It's you know, so like, sick. It's so sick. So... You actually covered a lot of the questions I was going to ask as far as like scouting the location and finding it. So you got just like this little tidbit from an article and then you did all the work with finding out where that place was. And then 
how did you get in there? Because that's where I'm like, that's where I go, <laughs> like five days of bike packing to get to a spot. I'll take, my, can I take my truck and my memory <laughs> foam mattress? Um, did you heli in? Did you hike in? You were with Kenny Smith, who is yeah. equally as gnar. Well, the original plan was to take my boat and uh, boat in and then hike up. Now, and then on. my boat, unfortunately, sank. And <laughs> I had uh, been rebuilding it. It's a different story. Uh, yeah, don't get me going on that story. It's a long one. Um, and then I'd been rebuilding it, and it wasn't finished in time. So we ended up um, going to Plan B, which is getting kind of like a... a you know, a blend. Of, we got dropped off in an area, and then we kind of hiked in and found our zones, and then made camp. Heli, heli drop. Yeah. Okay. So it was That's a bit, reasonable. It was a little bit of clamping slash. But it was suffering. still five days of hiking these huge granite. Yeah, there was faces. There, yeah, it was all by foot once we were there. Yeah. There was no glory days of getting getting heli dropped off at the long. top, and it's not environmentally friendly anyway. So yeah. the fact that you're earning your turns, earning your granite. Earn your skids. Earn your skids. Um, <laughs> is commemorable. Um, okay, so you're there. You're looking up at a face. Mm -hmm. You're going, I think I could ride that. You hike up to the top. Is there any sort of like, like, how do you not just <laughs> ride off a cliff? Like, <laughs> There's like, some like, spots. like you're hiking. Like, are you hiking up the line? Are you trying to hike up the line that you're trying to ride down? Because sometimes it's, I know, for like steeps, you can't physically hike up the rock because it's too slippery, or whatever. So you kind of have to like skirt around. Like, how do you, how do you scout a zone that has never been ridden before by anyone? Well, to be honest, this this place had been ridden by people, and mainly people that have worked in the helicopter industry because it's like a common like transit route for guys bringing in uh, all sorts of industries. So a lot of those guys have written it. So there's no claim at all that we were the first. Okay. okay. I'm not going to throw that claim. Sorry. And um, Thank you for your honesty. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, with these rock lines, it's very crucial that you walk up the line because, you know, when you're in dirt, you can find consistencies kind of similar to snow. Like dirt's gonna usually have a pretty consistent way that it falls where rock it's totally sporadic there could be a, like a nice pitch and then all of a sudden be like a four foot wall in the middle of like a 400 500 foot line that you if you dropped in without scoping it you just you'd be yeah ended. that's what i was wondering i'm like you can't just like tell from an airplane like i've done that before where you like look at a slope and you're like yo that looks sick and then you actually get there and it's like yeah. What you it thought were baby what you thought were baby heads are actually like yeah, boulders. <laughs> huge boulders and you're like, well, <laughs> never mind. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, okay. it's definitely a bit of a learning curve because for me that was the first time I went from searching for big lines in dirt to granite. So it was definitely a learning curve. Obviously I've ridden granite slabs throughout the years, but nothing in that, you know, magnitude. And then you don't have a trail to follow. So even if you do hike up your line, what's to say when you, because things look different when you're looking up them versus when you're looking down them. So you're like, okay, cool, I just walked this. Now you're turning around, you're looking down it, and you're like, it's totally different. Where did I? Because I know in Utah, we use little rocks to yeah. like pinpoint, like, okay, stay between the rocks or you die. Um, but like, everything mm -hmm. is rock, so there is no staying between the rocks. Yeah. And it's not like you can <laughs> like grab a little pebble get or a little, yeah. make a little cairn or like something. Like, how do you not get disoriented? Like, that's. Yeah, it's definitely a bit of a challenge and a lot of faith and trust um, and kind of visualizing the line from the bottom and kind of placing that where you are on the actual convex uh, line. Because a lot of times when you roll in, it'll be a convex kind of graduating slope where you, you consistently can't see where you're eventually going, which is quite creepy once you get to that like stage of you know terminal velocity where you're just kind of once you drop into that, you're just hanging on for dear life until it, it runs out and you're hoping that you're in the light, right l like line from the top down. Otherwise you're, you're in for a rough afternoon. And that's like your, that's the favorite, that's your favorite part though, like that risk. Yep. Yeah, of yep. course it is. Um, and then you uh, also mentioned in the video, the trust that you put into your riding partner and then your relationship with them you picked Kenny Smith. Absolutely. He's honestly... Yeah, I wanted to know what made you pick Kenny and maybe just talk a little bit about him because he's 
not here, obviously. Yeah, unfortunately, he's not here. But, you know, Kenny Smith has used to be one of the top, like, rock slab shredders in the Sea to Sky Corridor. And he was living in, in the Whistler area, pushing the boundaries that of riding down steep rock lines and really pushing the limits of that kind of stuff. And then he switched gears and he said, you know what, I'm just going to... I'm going to go back to real world. And he, he became a helicopter pilot. And to be honest, he's actually flown over that area just in transit. I did because, not know he was a helicopter pilot. Yeah. It's, mm. yeah. Um, so he ended up knowing, as soon as I told him, he's like, oh, yeah, I've flown over that area before. I've always wanted to check it out. So for him, he was like one of the best at that type of riding. And to be honest, me, I was very green. You know, obviously I've ridden, you know, like Squamish trails where there's big rock slabs and I'm very comfortable at home in it. But in terms of like really pushing the limits of these big granite lines, you know, to me, he was like, you know, like the master. So having him on board and, and him and I like bouncing off each other was like, I thought it was a great dynamic. And yeah, he's an awesome character. He's great. His cackle is just Oh my God, amazing. his laugh is the, his laugh is the best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well... Yeah, and you can totally see that translated through the film. So, uh, good job, good job, guys. Good right job, on. good job, Thanks. Kenny. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that kind of we wraps are. it up. Um, Should we watch the movies? Yeah. Again, we're just going to tease a little bit. Don't forget matinee tomorrow, two p.m. and three thirty p.m. More movies. Gala tomorrow night. More movies. Awards. Look at how cool these things are. Yeah, check right? this out. Right. Got some IF3 Film of the Year awards. The judges have been working tirelessly in picking the winners, so I suggest you all go and have a peek tomorrow. Um, and don't forget to join, follow IF3 Bike on social media. Mm -hmm. And yeah, register for 2022. And I think that's... Uh, so let's watch some freaking movies, eh? All right, guys. Good to have you out here. <laughs> Thanks so much, you guys. <laughs>